Hello, this is still Dr. Omindo. So we continue with our lecture series on the anterior abdominal wall. So we are now discussing the blood supply to the anterior lateral abdominal wall. So what are the sources? When you're asked to describe blood supply of any structure in anatomy, you are expected to at least name the vessels that supply the structure and state where the vessels come from. Okay, so for example, the anterior lateral abdominal wall is supplied by superior epigastric and musculophrenic arteries, and these come from internal thoracic artery. Remember, internal thoracic is from the first part of subclavian artery. Anterior abdominal wall is also supplied by inferior epigastric and deep circumflex um, iliac arteries, and these come from the external iliac artery, which is a branch of common iliac. Then we also have inferior phrenic artery supplying the anterior lateral abdominal wall. Inferior phrenic artery comes from the abdominal aorta. The lower posterior intercostal as well as subcostal arteries supply anterior lateral abdominal wall. These vessels come from uh, the thoracic aorta. Abdominal aorta also gives lumbar arteries that supply the anterior lateral abdominal wall. So this is how you discuss the uh, blood supply to the anterior lateral abdominal wall. We mentioned the vessels that supply and where they come from. Okay, so we go to the lymphatic drainage. Okay, lymphatic drainage. So you can see here the red are the blood vessels. Like for example, this is your internal thoracic from first part, first part of subclavian that's going to give superior epigastric and your musculophrenic vessels. Then you will have branches from external iliac coming upwards like this. And you also have lumbar vessels from the abdominal part of the um, aorta. And the thoracic aorta will be giving also the posterior inter intercostal and subcostal vessels supplying the anterior lateral abdominal wall. So what is the lymphatic drainage of the anterior abdominal wall? The umbilicus is usually the, the point of reference. So superficial lymphatics above the umbilicus or superficial lymphatics above the umbilicus are drained by the pectoral group of the axillary nodes these are the anterior group of the axillary lymph nodes so above the umbilicus superficial lymphatics are drained in the pectoral group of axillary lymph nodes while below the umbilicus superficial lymphatics drain into the superficial group of inguinal lymph nodes okay superficial group of inguinal lymph node will drain the anterior abdominal wall below the umbilicus. Then we discuss the inguinal canal. The inguinal canal is an oblique passage measuring three to five centimeters. Usually it passes through the abdominal wall. So it's an oblique passage approximately three to five centimeters passing through the abdominal wall and it runs parallel and above the inguinal ligament. So remember your inguinal ligament was from anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle and it forms the floor of the inguinal canal. So the canal is parallel and above the inguinal ligament. So what are the contents of the inguinal canal? In males, you have the spermatic cord and ilioinguinal nerve. In female, the inguinal canal contains the round ligament of the uterus and the ilioinguinal nerve. So inguinal canal contains ilioinguinal nerve, spermatic cord in males, and round ligament in of the uterus in females. So what are the boundaries of the inguinal triangle? So we have what we call the inguinal triangle, which is a triangle of Hasselbach's. So you need to understand this triangle. So the inguinal triangle or the Hasselbach's triangle, the medial border is formed by the lateral margin of rectus abdominis muscle. So remember, you have a right Hasselbach's triangle and the left Hasselbach. So we're going to discuss one side. So this is your rectus abdominis muscle. The medial boundary of this Hasselbach's triangle is the lateral border Of rectus abdominis muscle. Then laterally, Hasselbach's triangle is bordered by inferior epigastric vessels. So they form the lateral margin. Inferiorly, you have the inguinal ligament running from anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. So those are the boundaries of the Hasselbach's triangle. Lateral border of rectus abdominis, inferior epigastric vessels um, on the lateral aspect, and inferiorly, you have the inguinal ligament. Then you come to understand why we are discussing this Hasselbach's triangle. So we continue the inguinal canal. This is the canal. It's above and parallel to the inguinal ligament, which runs from anterior superior iliac spine to the 
pubic tubercle. The guano canal is three to five centimeters, and it has been likened to an arcade of three arcs that's formed by the three flat abdominal muscles. So you have your external oblique, internal oblique, and um, transverse abdominis muscle. So they form an arcade, and that's what forms the inguinal canal. They form an arcade over the inguinal ligament. So we have what we call processus vaginalis. Processus vaginalis is a diverticulum of peritoneum. Remember, peritoneum is inside the abdomen. So usually there's a diverticulum of the peritoneum that will evaginate the anterior abdominal wall to form inguinal canal. So the processus vaginalis is a diverticulum of the peritoneum that evaginates the anterior abdominal wall. So what happens? Usually the testis developmentally, the testis develop in the abdomen. Then they descend to the scrotum. How do they get to the scrotum? They pass through the inguinal canal. So through the deep inguinal ring into the inguinal canal through the superficial ring, that is how they enter the scrotum. So the testes usually enter inguinal canals just before birth. And after that, the processus vaginalis now obliterates. So they follow this processus vaginalis, this diverticulum of the peritoneum. So the peritoneum is in the abdomen. It evaginates through the inguinal canal. And as it evaginates, it provides a pathway for the testes to descend from the abdomen to the scrotum. After testicular descent, the testis enters the inguinal canal just before birth. Afterwards, processus vaginalis obliterates. Then we have what we call the gubernaculum. The gubernaculum attaches to the uterus, and usually it's divided into round ligament of the uterus and the ligament of the ovary. So the gubernaculum is divided into round ligament of the uterus and the ligament of ovaries. So this image just explains the testicular descent. The testes are usually in the abdomen. So you'll have the peritoneum, which is green. It evaginates into the inguinal canal. So the testes will now follow that evagination. So it will descend from the abdomen through the inguinal canal and to enter the, the scrotum. So it will descend through a deep ring into the inguinal canal through the superficial ring, enter into the scrotum. So in the seven week embryo, um, this shows how the testes before its descent from the dorsal abdominal wall. Then what happens? At the 28 weeks, the testis now passes through the inguinal canal. Then in a newborn, the testis is in the scrotum, okay? And thereafter, the processus vaginalis will obliterate. So the inguinal canal has two rings. It has a superficial inguinal ring and a deep inguinal ring. The superficial inguinal ring is just a triangular defect and um, the triangular defect on the external oblique abdominis. So its central point is superior to the pubic tubercle. Remember we say it is one centimeter superior lateral to the pubic tubercle. So the superficial inguinal ring is a triangular defect on the aponeurosis of external oblique abdominis and is superior to the pubic tubercle. Then the deep inguinal ring, it's oval, yeah, and it's located on the fascia transversalis. So deep inguinal ring is an opening in the fascia transversalis, which is the deep fascia of the abdomen, while superficial inguinal ring is an opening on the external oblique aponeurosis. So you have inferior epigastric vessels, which were the lateral boundary of the Hasselbach's triangle. These inferior epigastric vessels are medial. Yeah, They lie at medial boundary of the deep inguinal ring. So if you are to go back to the Hasselbach's triangle, you can see this is the deep ring. So the inferior epigastric vessels are medial to the deep inguinal ring. The inferior epigastric vessels are medial to the, and this deep ring is an opening on the fascia transversalis. The superficial ring is an opening on external oblique and is superior to the pubic tubercle. So the deep ring has the epigastric vessels medial to it. So it's lateral to the uh, inferior epigastric vessels. So this is your superficial inguinal ring. Okay. And as you go upwards at the midpoint of the inguinal ligament, somewhere here, you'll find your deep ring. And the deep ring is located, uh, has inferior epigastric vessels medial to it. And these inferior epigastric vessels are the lateral boundary of the Hasselbach's triangle formed by inguinal ligament inferiorly and the lateral margin of the rectus on the medially. Then laterally is the inferior epigastric vessels. So what are the boundaries of the inguinal canal? The inguinal canal has four boundaries. Anteriorly, it's mainly formed by external oblique, but it is reinforced by internal oblique muscle laterally. 
So for each of these coordinates, you must name two structures for each wall. So anteriorly, external oblique abdomen is reinforced laterally by internal oblique abdomen. Posteriorly is by the conjoint tendon formed by internal oblique and transverse abdomen muscle as well as fascia transversalis. So the conjoint tendon and fascia transversalis form the posterior wall. What forms the roof of the inguinal canal? The arcing fibers of the posterior two flat muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. So arcing fibers of internal oblique abdominis and the transverse abdominis muscle. And what forms the floor? It's formed by the inguinal ligament and reinforced medially by the lacunar ligament. So each of these walls has two structures. So anteriorly, external and internal oblique, Posteriorly, conjoint tendon and fascia transversalis, the roof, you have arcing fibers of internal oblique and transverse abdominis, and the floor, you have inguinal and lacunar ligament. Then we discuss the spermatic cord. Spermatic cord usually begins at the deep inguinal ring and ends at the posterior border of the testis in the scrotum. So it begins at the deep inguinal ring and ends at the posterior border of the testis. What are the coverings of the spermatic cord? We had discussed this. You have internal spermatic fascia formed by fascia transversalis. Premasteric muscle formed by internal oblique and external spermatic fascia formed by external oblique muscle. Therefore, transverse abdominis muscle does not form a covering from the spermatic cord. So, external oblique muscle from external spermatic fascia, internal oblique muscle from premasteric muscle, then fascia transversalis from the internal spermatic fascia. What are the contents of the spermatic cord? It contains three arteries, three nerves, and three other structures. So we have the three arteries, testicular artery, cremasteric artery, and artery traverse difference. Spermatic cord has three arteries, testicular artery, cremasteric artery, and artery traverse difference. It contains three nerves, and these nerves are the genitofemoral nerve, which innervates the cremasteric muscle. Then you have autonomic nerves, so sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. So those are the nerves in the spermatic cord. Then you have three other structures in the spermatic cord. You have the papiniform plexus or veins, lymphatic vessels and vas different. So those are the nine contents of the sperm. So the spermatic cord has three coverings, external, cremasteric, and internal spermatic fascia. Then you have three arteries, testicular artery, cremasteric artery, and artery to vas. Then you have three nerves, genitofemoral nerve and autonomic sensory nerves, and other three structures, from pinnipum plexus of veins, lymphatic vessels, and the vas difference. So we said that the inguinal canal has the ilioinguinal nerves in both males and females, but in males, the inguinal canal also contains the spermatic cord, while in females, the inguinal canal contains the round ligament of the uterus. So we have the mechanics of the inguinal canal. So you can see in a, when the anterior abdominal wall muscles are relaxed, you can see those, the arcing. Yeah, so the canal is open. But when the anterior abdominal wall muscles are contracting, what happens? The arcs lower so you tend to close or shatter the inguinal canal so inguinal canal is a site for potential weakness so there's potential weakness in both sexes and when you cough or you strain during micturition defecation parturition because of valsava maneuver you strain and increase pressure in the abdomen it is expected that when you increase the pressure yeah anterior abdominal wall muscles contract the diaphragm uh, goes low so the volume of the abdomen decreases and there's increase in pressure. So you may expect that the viscera in the abdomen will leave, look for any potential space to leave the abdomen. But this does not occur. So during straining, what happens? These arcing fibers that you see here in a relaxed state, during straining, the muscles contract. So these arcing fibers that form the roof of the inguinal canal, remember they are formed from the internal oblique and transverse abdominis muscles. So they will contract and flatten the arc. So in turn, you lower the roof of the canal and the floor, therefore you close the canal. So that prevents herniation. It prevents structures, viscera from the abdomen to herniate through the inguinal canal and leave the abdomen. So that is how hernias occur. So in the next slide, we are going to discuss inguinal hernias.